Are we good now, Pastor? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like Pastor said, I'm uh, your Pastor Brian's younger brother, much younger brother. <clears throat> and um, I just feel kind of awkward in the middle of your celebration here today, but I'm so glad. I mean, I've known uh, Pastor Rudy I, in the first service. I was telling everybody 10 years. You know what? No, it's been a lot longer than that. And uh, I, you look older, but I look the same. I mean, I, it's, and uh, it's been a lot, lot longer. And I've been hearing the same things for all these years. It's been over a decade and a half, I think. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, it was moving. When I saw that video this morning, I, I had tears. And um, that's just a great, great blessing. That uh, And the Lord's that way. It's his work after all. It's his timing. He knows exactly what he's doing. So we can sit back and relax. He's got it under control, and I'm sure he does now. And uh, I, I'm preaching at my church on the 30th. I can't even be here unless I find somebody to substitute, but I really want to be here. Uh, and I've been telling Brian for the longest time, please count me in. I want to be here. Tell me when. And so he tells me this week, you know, and... Uh, uh, not exactly fair. Anyway, I want to give you a brief introduction, and that is um, um, concerning the second um, <clears throat> chapter of the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. Now, we know that as Colossians chapter 2, but uh, the church in Colossae is a little bit unique. Let me tell you a little bit about it, just briefly, so you get the idea of, of why Paul is writing this and what he's talking about. Colossae is right dead center in what today is Turkey. It's still the leftovers of it. Uh, you know, the ruins are still there, and it's a tourist attraction. Uh, but it's known because it's part of three neighboring cities. It was the main city when it was first built. And it was um, a central point for everybody going east and west. So you can imagine that it was very industrial, it was very commercial, and very prosperous. The city was divided into three, where they had the residential, the commercial, and the industrial, all separated by separate walls. And to our knowledge, you know, uh, Paul never actually visited this city. Uh, but through his ministry... Uh, the church was started. And let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, we know the church at Colossae. We know Colossae because uh, later on a subsequent city was built, a more wealthy city, because it basically started for all the rich people in Colossae to move to, and um, it became the place to be. So everybody started moving there, and it became the center. And that city is called Laodicea. And we know that from Revelation. It was the last of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. But anyway, Paul um, started this church through his ministry, but not directly. In fact, we have no record of him actually ever going to Colossae, and he didn't even know these people. But he knew them through a friend called Epaphras. Um, Epaphras and, of course, Philemon. Philemon, we know because Paul wrote to Philemon. He wrote at the same time, and as a matter of fact, he wrote through Tychicus, who delivered the letters, both letters, and he delivered them at the same time, and most likely to the same place. In fact, most scholars believe that Philemon hosted the church in his house in Colossae. And, and we think that it has a lot to do because nine different people are mentioned in both letters by name, and so we assume that Paul is referring to these people because Philemon knew them, and also because the people at Colossae knew them. And among them, of course, Onesimus, which was the runaway slave who got, who ended up, you know, that's just God. He ended up in Rome, met Paul, Paul led him to the Lord, sent him back to Colossae. And he went with Epaphras. Epaphras seems and is most likely the person who actually started the work and on, um, Philemon hosted it in his home. That's how the church most likely got started. However, there were some problems in the church and Epaphras told Paul, listen, this is going on, uh, they're doing this and they're saying this and they're practicing that and Paul says, let me address it. 
Let me take care of that. So he writes a letter to these people addressing those issues. Not that he knows them. So he, uh, there are some letters that Paul writes that are very forceful and direct, such as the letter to the Corinthians. How <laughs> I many he tells them what for? The Corinthians were real problems. But the Colossians, you notice a slight difference because it's more flowery speech. See, he didn't know these people, so he couldn't say, you, you, you. Uh, it, it was third people. He had heard it. So he said, in generalities, let's address these problems, but it's not directly to any individual or people within the church. So um, there are many different kinds of uh, warnings that the Bible tells us and gives us about. In fact, that's what it's all about. Be careful. Now, it's not in an effort to limit us in what we do. God does not say, be careful because um, I don't want you to have fun. I don't want you to enjoy yourself. No, he says, don't do it or be careful or watch out because I don't want you to get hurt or I don't want you to hurt somebody else. So they're warnings for our own good. Now, 35 times in the Bible is the word beware used. And he has specific things that he talks about. We won't cover. That's a different you know, sermon. For another day we won't cover all those but I did want to give you a sample of what God might think that is important enough to uh, say beware about so in Deuteronomy 6 one that applies to what we're talking about this morning in this video uh, it says beware lest you forget the Lord and it, the the circumstances were when they were going into the promised land he said listen now that you're uh, you know Getting the blessing for that which you've worked and waited for, for coincidentally, 40 years. 40 years. Now you're getting what I've been promising. Don't forget the Lord. That's something we could apply to our hearts today. September 30th is coming. It's the fulfillment. It's the promised land. It's what everybody's worked for and dreamed about for all this time since the beginning don't forget the Lord. Number two, and Matthew, this is Jesus himself, he says, uh, beware of false prophets in chapter 7, but that the Bible is full of that. False prophets seems uh, to be a real problem in all churches everywhere at all times because the Bible repeats that over and over. A false prophet is one who teaches things that are incorrect. So, number three, beware lest you be consumed by one another in Galatians 5. So, Paul is saying, listen, you, you can do this because of strife, because of jealousies, because of envies, because of being discontent, because of gossip. And he lists all these things in Galatians that he said, you know, you're going to end up devouring one, one another. Because the carnality within us has that tendency. We turn on each other. By the way, have you noticed that this mighty, powerful army of God, our helmet of salvation, nice and shiny, you know, we've got a breastplate of righteousness, our shield of faith, a sword of the Spirit, where we have our loins girded with truth, our, sh our feet uh, shod with the preservation of the gospel, and you know what? We spend most of our time polishing our armor or use it to fighting each, fight each other. It's backwards. We're supposed to be guarding against Satan and fighting him and charging the world and we worry about what's going on in the church. The church is made to come to worship God. Well, I'm sorry, I don't like their style of worship. That's okay. We're not here to worship you. There's a lot of different styles of worship. That's okay. As long as your focus is Him. If you come in here to worry about how they play the instruments, who sings best, how Sally's dressed, what Peter is saying, your focus is not on Jesus. Turn it back to where it needs to be. Don't consume each other. Focus on God. Okay, so that is... The basic of the bewares. But now that brings me to Colossians. 
Chapter 2, verse 8 starts out by saying, Beware lest anyone cheat you. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James. <clears throat> verse 8 starts out like this. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now, <laughs> that is a very powerful scripture that basically kind of leaves us out of things. It talks about he's everything. And he wants you to know that there are people out there trying to take away something from you. They're trying to cheat you. So uh, there are several different heresies that had been penetrating the Colossian church. And I want to mention them to you. I want to just define them. But we're not going to talk about them in depth because I'm only going to talk about one today. And um, we'll start by that one. It's legalism. Now, I, I didn't write this. I had to cheat and go to Merriam-Webster, the dictionary. So it says this, It's the strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to a religious moral code. Yeah, I couldn't have said that anyway. I don't talk that way. It's, um, uh, e, the number two is Eastern philosophy. And I did write this because Eastern philosophy, and you'll notice a pattern as we go through all five of these. It might have been written 2,000 years ago. Might have been written by a Jewish guy to Gentiles in Asia Minor, but it's so relevant today. You're going to read that and you think, oh, wait, that's, I, that's going on now. Watch this. Number two is Eastern philosophy. There's the teaching of religious tolerance. In, in other words, that one religion is as good as the other. Have you seen that bumper sticker that has all the religious symbols that spell coexist? Of course you have. You know, that's not absolutely possible at all, ever, anywhere. What that really means is they can coexist in their own way, but we just have to maintain separate. You, you know that the Eastern philosophy teaches that um, religion is like a, a mountain. God at the top. And you may scale it from this side, the north. Uh, the other people may scale it from the south, east, west, whatever. And they're all different perspectives. The roads are different, but they all lead to the same God. And you know what? That is a lie from the pits of hell. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father, but by me. There are not multiplicity of ways to get to God. There's only one way to get to God. We cannot coexist. We must teach the truth. So anyway, we have Gnosticism. That's the next one. It comes from a Greek word. Um, there's uh, gnosis. And gnosis is uh, basically knowledge. And we have it all used throughout Scripture in many different ways. But... Um, um, it's the belief that the world was created and ruled uh, by a lesser divinity, um, a demiurge, um, that Christ was an emissary, a, a remote God, lesser God, of the main God, and he uh, transmitted these things to us in an esoteric form. In other words, he can't appeal to us directly. And it's all about the knowledge you acquire in an esoteric manner of God. And through that transcendental meditation or astral projections or whatever way you can uh, attain knowledge of God, you increase in your spirituality. It's all about how much you know. That is obviously very false. Uh, now, there's another. There's Greek philosophy. And the Greek philosophy says, and this is very 
similar to the Gnosis because they all come from the same roots. Different Greek philosophers said these things. The main Greek philosophy said that all matter is evil. Therefore, a holy God cannot come down and meet with something that's evil, namely us. So there is no way to breach the gap. We're evil, he's holy, and up to that point, they're right. But here's where it breaks down. They said the only way that we can do it is that God has to somehow send a vibrations and spirits and communicate through some esoteric form to somehow get us to experience something of him. To illuminate us through meditation again. Greeks were big on that. I can think my way through things. I can attain a higher plane of existence if I only concentrate. I can attain. Well, that doesn't work either. Paul had to address that. Uh, finally, and this is probably my favorite because it's still very applicable to our culture today, our subculture here in South Florida and Latin America, the asceticism. The asceticism can be defined, and again, I went to Merriam-Webster, severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Now, nothing to me has been more gut-wrenching than to walk some, to see somebody walk on their knees, bloody. It, it, it was just painful to watch. They would walk for miles to get to some big, huge cathedral, light a big candle in front of a stone piece of painted ceramic. Meaningless. It meant nothing. All that sacrifice. There are people in the Philippines who in Easter actually have the custom of crucifying themselves or having their family members crucify them. There are others who actually get whips and beat themselves into subjection supposedly. All the penitence and all the repentance and all those self-sacrifices mean absolutely nothing. So let's go back and address the one I want to address this morning, and that's uh, legalism. Now, you and I practice legalism because we're human beings. Because that's how we do things. And, and uh, in verse 16, it tells us, um, it starts out by saying, let no one judge you. The rest of the verse continues, said, in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, or, or which are, you know, a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. What we see and do now is not reality. We think it is. It's not. Reality is what's to come. Paul said it. We, you know, right now we're looking in the mirror and we really can't see it. It's all dingy and it's not true. I wish what I saw in the mirror were not true. <laughs> but anyway, we, we don't see reality. What I see in the mirror is an image. It's not me. But when we see Jesus, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, we'll become like him because we will see him as he is. Reality. So we have to address these things. First of all, I would like, um, uh, again, to um, remind us of legalism. What this is, is the strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law, a set of rules and regulations, you know, or a moral code of some kind. You have to behave in a certain way. You have to do certain things in order to accomplish whatever goal you have. So anyway, there are dangers of legalism, and I wrote down four. There are many more, but just four I want to mention. It inflates the ego, small a. You see, because by attaining something, you got your checklist in your mind, of course. You got your checklist. I've got to do this, this, and this. Now, if I go to church, that's one checklist. Now, we used to do this in Sunday school when I was a kid. In Sunday school, we had a big board. All the names of the kids. Now, if you came, you got a star. If you came and brought your Bible, you got two stars. If you came, brought your Bible, memorized yours, you got three stars. 
That's not a bad thing, okay? But we still have that mentality as we grow up. So I'm a good person if I come to church. If I come to church and I know the music, I'm pretty good. But if I come to church, I know the music, and I give my dollar, I'm good for the week. However, if I come to church, know the music, give my dollar, and come to a circle, I'm better than you. <laughs> oh yeah, it inflates the ego because it's not about Jesus. It's about what I do. <laughs> the small b, it makes one content in self-righteousness. You're telling yourself you're righteous. You're lying to yourself. And so you become satisfied. I've done that already this week, so I'm good to go. Uh, small c, it opens the door to judgment. Because you say, well, if I can do it, so-and-so should do it. And if I do it and they don't do it, I'm better than you. Right? I know more than you. I've heard five sermons that you haven't served, heard because you weren't here. I'm better than you. Doesn't matter what you hear unless you apply it. So, uh, the last one, small d, legalism denies, and here's the big one, the sufficiency of Christ. It denies the sufficiency of Christ. See, that's the main problem because we're actually looking in the face of Lord God Almighty and we're saying, you're not enough. You need my help. It's a slap in the face. Now, there are certain truths about legalism we need to be aware of. And small a under two, the basis for our freedom is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Not our own. I, I want to read a verse here in 16. It says, So let no one judge you in food, drink, etc., etc. Uh, but then at the very end, it says, um, After the shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Well, it could have said the substance is mostly Christ, but a little bit of me. Is a, you know, 90% of Christ and, you know, he needs me to do this. No. If you don't do what the Lord's calling you to do, and by the way, he's calling everybody at all times for many reasons, he's got something for you to do today, even this afternoon. When you leave this place, you're to shine for him. You're not to live for yourself. So when he gives you something to do and you decide, I, I, I don't think I will, you are personifying this very truth. You are showing that it's not about the person and work of Christ. It's a little bit about me. What you're saying is, God's lucky to have me. I'll see if I have time to go out and call somebody or make a visit. Maybe one day I'll schedule it and I'll see if I have time to witness to somebody. Did you know that's the only pre reason you have a heartbeat today? <laughs> we got things so messed up. We act like God needs us. We're doing him a favor by coming to church. It's raining. This is worth two. Really? No. We need him. And it's an honor and a privilege to be counted among his. We are not who we think we are. In fact, we are not who others say we are. We are his, because he says we are. Never forget who bought you, who paid for you with his very life. 
You are his. Every breath, every heartbeat, every thought. And we are to take it and submit it to him. So, a um, couple of things here. Actually, three. The fullness dwells in him in verse 9. Not in us. Now, when something's full, how can you add to it? You can't add, well, Christ did it all. I understand that. You know, we, we sing the song, or we used to, it's so old. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Well, Jesus paid it all, but he needs my help sometimes. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. No, the, the fullness is in him. Check out verse 9. And when it's full, there's nothing else left to give. And number two, he canceled the debt and dominion of the law. There's nothing else the law can do you. You're free. You're done. It's accomplished. You know, the number seven is very special in the Bible. It, it actually means completeness. We, we actually sometimes have, give it a misnomer. It's the number of perfection. But what we mean really is that it's complete. There's nothing else to do. It's complete. It's perfect. It's done. Can't add to it. It's complete. Guess how many words or how many times Jesus spoke on the cross? Seven. What was the last thing he said? Trivia. Last thing he said. Before he breath, breathes his last, it is finished. Now, he could have said, it is finished, except for what you got to do. Now, the Apostle John was right there, and he could have said, well, Lord, wait, I, I got a right revelation yet. You need me. No. It is finished. It's done. It's done. There's nothing left. And number three, uh, we are under grace, not the law. And Paul, of course, knows this well. He wrote in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, about how we are not under the law anymore. We're under grace. The law says, everybody wears a blue shirt. Everybody who doesn't wear a blue shirt is not like me and didn't get the memo. Therefore, I judge you because I've done the right thing. Grace says, I don't care what color you use or whether it even has a collar. It makes no difference. Well, here, the law says we're not equal. But we want to be equal. But we can't be equal. Some people are smarter. Some people are better looking. Some people are more talented. Some people are taller. Some people are thinner. Some people can see better. Some people are not diabetic like I am. Some people, you know, we're different. Some people are of the female persuasion, go figure. And we're different. But you know what God says under grace? This is a mathematical Term, we are all equivalent. You learned that in first grade. They had three apples, three oranges, and you're supposed to say, are they the same? No, they're not the same, but they have equal value. They're equivalent. Therefore, grace says, we're all the same. We're all the same what? As good? We're all the same as bad. We're all the same sinners. So, B... Uh, let's talk about the bondage. In verse 16, it tells us, so let no one judge you. And it talks about the food and the festivals and the new moon, the Sabbath. And Paul addresses that in other places, such as Romans 14. And anyway, Peter calls it, in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, he calls it a yoke. You know what a yoke is, right? Is that when they put two animals together, they put a piece of wood on top, a piece of wood on bottom, bolt them together. So the animals will have to do what the person behind them with rain says. You can't just go off. You got to do, you're, you're locked in with something else. You got to follow that pattern, that path. Well, that's the yoke. Then Paul said again in Galatians chapter 5, he said, wait a minute. Listen, if you keep doing these things, all these rules and regulations, you're going to become entangled. 
Don't become entangled with all these things. It's going to trip you up in your Christian life. Finally, we come to small c and the blessing of grace in verse 17. And um, in, in verse 17, I lost verse 17. Oh, yeah. Verse 17, uh, which are a shadow of things to come. And, and we see things that we think are there but are not there. Janine and I watched this TV show last night called, uh, that my, my son turned us on, it's on Netflix. It's called uh, Magic for Humans. Uh, have you ever seen this? This is pretty funny stuff. But we watched one segment of it, and he says, I'm going to try to convince someone that they're invisible. So here's what he does. He gathers an audience, and he says, listen, you got, I need you to be in on it. So what I want you to do, I'm going to perform several meaningless tricks to attract a crowd. And then I'm going to select somebody out of the crowd who's not in on the joke. And I'm going to have them sit right here in front of everybody. I'm going to cover him with a blanket. When I pull him off, you guys go, ooh, and act like he's invisible. So anyway, he does these tricks, and he puts two chairs. On one chair, he, he plays a trick, and he acts like this guy disappears. He actually sneaks out the back, pulls the thing back, and he holds a can in the air and levitates it, supposedly. And the crowd goes wild, ooh, right? Oh, now it's your turn. This is the guy who's not in on it, right? So he puts the thing over, and he does the same thing, pulls it off, and the crowd goes wild. Ooh, and he's sitting there. Everybody sees him, but nobody says anything. He's like gone. And, and he asks for some people to come up, and they reach for him, and of course, they act like they can't get him. So he gets up, and he starts poking at people, sticking his tongue out at people. And he says... I'm here, how come they can't see me? And everybody acts like they can't see him. So he walks in the crowd, checks people purpose, purses, pull things out, and they act like they can't see him. He actually becomes convinced and then becomes scared because the magician gets a call and walks off. <laughs> so he's freaking out. Nobody can see me. Finally, everything comes back, and they let him in on the joke, and he's so embarrassed about everything. It, it was hilarious. But the point is this. Satan has covered us off and making us think that something is real that is not. We're fooled. We're crazy. We're doing things that are just mind-boggling. You know why? You know why? Because of legalism. We're trying to do it on our own. We're trying to give God something that's already been done. There is nothing left to you for, to do. It's been done. And we keep trying to please Him in all these rules and regulations. Well, finally... I want to leave you with the blessings of grace that he mentions in verse 17. And these are things that I wrote. This is not, um, and, and you don't have to write this. If you don't like the outline, just uh, turn it over. There's an origami instruction in the back. You may put it in or whatever. Anyway, here, uh, see if this grabs you like it did me. I wrote this. Legalism seeks to measure while grace is immeasurable. Now, I don't care. What ruler you use, legalism wants to define you and measure you. And everybody else, by the way, according to your stick. While grace says, there is no measure. I accept you, whatever, whenever, however. The second thing is this, legalism emphasizes us. Grace emphasizes Christ. That's the difference. You can spot it anywhere you go. If legalism emphasizes a structure, a statue, a trinket, a whatever it may be, a tradition, you got to kneel on this rug, you got to face a certain way. <laughs> really? As if God's not everywhere at all times? No. No. It emphasizes Christ, it's okay. If it emphasizes man, it's legalism. 
So uh, fortunately, he doesn't leave us hanging. And, and here's some instructions on how to avoid heresy. Number one, verses 18 and 19, he says, let no one cheat you. He, he uses that phrase again for the second time. Uh, and then he says, of your reward. Wait, what? A reward? We're getting a reward? Well, besides the rewards we're getting in heaven, you're getting a reward here. And that is, I'll, I'll explain it bit by bit. Um, small a, if anyone is to cheat you of a reward, it's number one by bringing you back into slavery, bondage. You see, Christ freedom fr freed us from that bondage. So anybody trying to impose rules and regulations and traditions on you brings you back to that bondage. They're cheating you of your freedom in Christ. He said, I've come to bring you not only life, but life more abundantly. What does that mean? Can you have life 2.0? What does that mean? That means life freely, abundantly. Nobody telling you, you got to do this, you can't do that. Freedom. Small b, by seeking more than the Word of God offers. And you know what that means? Experiences. Oh, I went to this church, I heard that guy speak, and I got goosebumps. Oh, that worship service. I, I just, I just... Oh, I felt it. That's wonderful. That's marvelous. If you worship in that manner, that's a wonderful thing. We all should. It should be heartfelt. But don't confuse the feelings with the divine nature of God. Feelings are human. If you can devote that much passion into worship, I'm glad you get goosebumps. I'm glad you have the feelings, but it doesn't come from God. It comes from you, and you should devote that kind of worship to Him. That's not your ultimate goal. Your ultimate goal is Him. Your ultimate goal is not what you feel when you worship. It's how He feels about your worship. Verses 20 and 23, he says, Do not subject yourself to regulations. Just point blank, he sums it up. There it is. Don't do it. And by the way, subject yourselves is a will, willing thing. You're willingly saying, Okay, I'll do it. Okay. I'm subjecting myself. Don't do it. Finally, rely on the sufficiency of Christ. The word for the day, sufficiency. There's nothing more you can add. It's full. It's done. <laughs> and I want to leave you with this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. And you probably know them. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For by strength... Is made perfect, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power of, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's only when you come to say, you're right, Lord, I can't do it, that he will completely fill you and indwell you. Thank you. Let's pray.